I want to talk to you this morning about entering into a dialogue with God because of your destiny. You do know that God is provocative, right? He says things to provoke our curiosity. He, sa he says things to provoke our mindset. Some of the things he says make us a little bit annoyed. Have you noticed that God is not afraid to make you annoyed? Yeah. And he says things provocatively because he has to challenge a mindset that's actually killing us. He says things provocatively to shock us out of where we are and make us think, man, I need to move out of this place. He says things to us that make us go, what? What on earth does that mean? And you know that when God says something that's not immediately clear to us, it's deliberate. I don't know what that means. I know. <laughs> well, what does it mean? What do you think it means? <laughs> I don't really know. That's why I'm asking you. Well, why don't we talk about it? So when he says something that you don't understand, it's an invitation to a chat. Go put the kettle on. Make him a coffee. He likes it black. One sugar. Make him a coffee. Make him a cup of tea. Sit down. It's an invitation to a conversation. And when God begins to speak to you about your destiny, there are some things about your destiny that you will not understand right here, right now, because our space here and now is cluttered with stuff that shouldn't be there. So when you bring destiny into the present, it's like, where does that fit in with this? Well, it doesn't fit in, dummy. <laughs> I say that in the sweetest possible way. That doesn't fit in with this because this shouldn't be here, right? So this, like, I don't, where does this fit into my life? Well, if we got rid of all the stuff that shouldn't be there, then this would, you'd see where this would fit. But you've got too much going on in this room. So when destiny comes, it, it, it gives you a spring clean in your thinking, in the way that you see things, and it starts to change your language. So whenever our future is opened up by the Lord, a, a process comes into view, a pathway starts to open up that we can start to follow. And that takes us from the present to the future and back again, because we're always moving. It's like in relationship with God, we're always moving joyfully between a much-loved child and a fully mature son. It's not like maturity is not moving on to the point where you don't need the kid anymore. You always need the kid. You always need to be a much loved child because um, you can beat the enemy better by being a much loved child than being a fully mature son. Because kids are fearless. Yeah? So we always need, you always have at least two relationships with God much loved child, fully mature son. So when you're really up against it, this kid can get you anything. It's like my granddaughter. Look at me, I'll give you anything. Yeah, simple. Come before God as a much loved child because that kid can get anything out of Jesus. I'm telling you, it's true. So, and then in the kingdom then, we, we, we are learning that we're also moving from present to future and back again. It's like, you know, when you're walking down the street, you know, a part of you is like, you know, you're looking at the sidewalk because you don't want to trip over a matchstick or anything. So you, you know, and you're walking down the sidewalk making sure that, you know, you're looking at your feet, but then you, you keep looking up to where you're going, keep looking down, keep looking up. We walk like that. Yeah, otherwise we walk into things and we'd spend half our life in the emergency room. Well, life in the spirit is like that. We're looking at the future, we're looking at the present, we're looking where we're going, we're looking at the present, we're looking where we're going, we're looking at who we're becoming, we're looking at who we are now, right now. And I love that whole paradox. Two apparently conflicting ideas contained in the same truth. I love that. That 
I can be fully present with the Lord, but also engaged with my future. That I can bring that future into the present and work on it. And let that future thing, that outcome thing, work on who I am right now in terms of upgrading how I see, how I think, how I speak. So to live fully in the present with the future in mind, we must establish the future as a viable stimulus on the here and now. And we do that by understanding that the future is the outcome is all about our dreams, prophecy, vision, scripture, promises, permissions, all those things spoken of us are about our future and our present, learning to combine and learning to overlap. So you can have this present thing and you can have this future thing and then where they overlap is actually where you live. You live in the bubble that they create when they connect. It opens up this space, you live in that space with a sense of this is who I am in the present but this is who I'm becoming. And we're always bringing that future thing into this present thing. And, and the brilliant thing about it is it's utterly confusing to the enemy. He just wants you in one place. And the place he would prefer you to live in is the past. He don't like it when you live in the present, but he still feels in the present, if you've got no sense of your future, he's got a shot at doing something with you. But once that future thing comes into the present, he is confused. Because now he doesn't know which one of you to attack, the future you or the present you. (laughs) Wonderful. Both are present. The present you and the future you are both doing business with Jesus. Bring them into the same space. You know, it's impossible, right, just to have one relationship with God. That's why you're a much loved child and a fully mature son. Because he's much too creative just to deal with one of you. So he's making you into a couple of people so that you've got this range of relationship that you can have with him. Yeah? Because he, you know, everything he does is big. And in that process of engaging with the present and the future, it creates an overlap, it creates a bubble in which our identity begins to take shape. It's like when present and future are in the same space, your identity is magnified. You see the end of you from the beginning of you. You see where you are, you see where you're going, and it's amazing. And you can pray in both ways. And so it's a huge learning curve where we're being shaped and trained by who we are becoming in Jesus. We know what the Lord wants us to become in terms of our identity. Your identity is the most important thing about you. Who you are now in Jesus and who you are becoming. And you, with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given to you to empower you to understand your identity and to walk in it. So everything about him is to train you for the life now and the one to come. Life in the spirit this month and life in the spirit next year. He trains you with the future in mind always because there's a better version of you out there. Thank the Lord Jesus, eh? Thank the Lord Jesus. There's a better version of you out there. Or as my friend... uh, Kim Clement wrote a great song that said, God sees you in the future and you look much better than you look right now. (laughs) There's a better version of you coming. What you need to do is live in a way that attracts it. Yeah? Everything about Jesus, I think, is eminently attractive. And we have to bring into the present the character of that future persona and start to develop the quality of perception Um, the mindset and the language of that person that God is reinventing. There's a better version of you coming and he's going to have a better way of thinking. Going to see with a different lens. They have a whole different language 
And that's what we're learning. That is our learning curve. And in, in order to have those things present and working in a deep way, we have to break the mold of our old nature. We have to break the mold of the old self that creates so that a real change can come over us. You cannot live in the kingdom with your old self because your old self cannot make the journey. Only the new man can make the journey. Jesus came to kill off the old one. He didn't come to give it a makeover. He came to kill it. Because nobody in heaven wanted to work on the old you. Jesus came to kill it. Came to crucify the old man. He's not doing anything to upgrade your old man. He's upgrading your new one. Right? You're being rewired, reprogrammed, rebuilt, reinvented. And the old is dead. Read Romans 6. The old is dead. Jesus came to kill off the old man because the old man was too bad to be cleansed. It had to be crucified. And so when Jesus died, you died. Hallelujah. When he was buried, that old man was buried. And when he rose from the, get, the dead, you rose from the dead as a new man, not the old, the old man did not rise from the dead magically transformed. No, the old man is in the grave. Let him rest in peace. A new man with a new nature rose up and God is only dealing with the new man. Welcome to the gospel. So God isn't dealing with your old nature because that will be like resurrecting that old man and giving it plastic surgery. It's still going to smell. <laughs> you, there's no makeover possible. There's nothing that can be done for the old man. It's dead. He that is dead is free from all those entanglements. And now we're in a new man and God is only dealing with the new man. And so what he's doing now is he's bringing that new man with a new lens, totally new way. He's got bionic eyes. They're only seeing what God is seeing, new man. Can only think the way that God thinks, new man. Can only speak the way God speaks, new man. So we're learning this new man routine. That God is, all the old things have passed away, everything has become new. And so God is engaging with your new man all the time. So I, I think that the old picture of you should be laughed at. It's like, you know, when you get those old photographs out when you were a teenager, <laughs> like with me when my hair was halfway down my back and I looked like some weird hippie. I look at those and <laughs> that was me. Yeah, I used to think like that when I was 19. Old photographs can be laughed at. New pictures of you need to be celebrated. And we should have, take those old pictures out and. I am so not that person anymore, for which we all respond, thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so he's, the new man has dreams, has prophecy, has vision, has scripture, has promises, has permission to start a new dialogue about how, would, how do we change our story? How are we going on this different journey? And what is my life going to look like from this point on? And, and all those things, promises, prophecy, dreams, they all merge together into this divine permission that's designed to establish His vision over us, His way of thinking, and for us to learn that new language. You know, this weekend, you will hear us banging the drum. But banging that drum, that same drum about identity. The identity is made up of perspective, the lens by which you see. Mindset, the way in which you think. Language of the new man. You're learning all things new. And we're going to bang that drum in every single session. 
so that we get it. Because you cannot have a new lens and think the old way. You can't want new but think old. Nothing's going to happen. Unless your transformation can only come by the renewing of your mind. And your mind needs something to see. It needs a picture. It needs a lens. And then your mindset adjusts to the lens that God is giving you. If you don't renew your mind, you may get a breakthrough this weekend, but you will not keep it. Unless you change the way that you think about yourself, you cannot keep any breakthrough that God gives you. You can enjoy it in the moment, but it will evaporate. But a new mind keeps it around forever. If you don't change your mind, your old thoughts will take you all the way back down. When your mind is renewed, your language needs to be upgraded. How you talk in general is important, that we learn the general language of the kingdom, which is about grace, it's about goodness, it's about kindness, it's about love, it's about mercy, it's about humility, it's about joy. We learn the general language of the kingdom. But we also need to learn the specific language of how you talk about yourself. It has to be very, very specific. Because when God gives you a prophetic word or a promise, He's giving you specific language with which you can navigate this next series of steps. And so you need to learn a new language about yourself because you've got to talk about yourself differently. It doesn't mean you have to brag. If you're going to boast, boast about what Jesus is doing. Boast about what Jesus has done for you. But he's going to give you a new language, and that new language is both humble and powerful. It's this is who I am. This is who I am becoming. And it's a confident language. And don't ever mis mis mistake confidence for bragging. It's not. It's confidence is not arrogance. You can be confident and humble, but I'm confident. This is who I am. This is who I'm becoming. And I'm really delighted about where I am right now. I like who I am right now. And I'm going to love the next version of me even more. But I like who I am right now. You know, I'm not what I used to be. And that's the grace of God. I'm not yet what I will be, and that'll be by the grace of God. So by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I like who I am. Anybody who doesn't like me, take it up with the management. Because I'm changing as fast as I can. And I hope that you're changing as fast as I am. But if you're judging me, maybe that's not true. Just saying. Just saying. If one of us is judging, one of us is not doing well. <laughs> so identity must create, it must create an upgrade in our relationship with the Lord. We get to walk in a new and living way. That's why God gives us dreams, prophecy, vision, promises, to get us out from under our current identity and circumstances. Because he wants you living above the line of your privilege, not below it. We're in Christ. And in Christ is an elevated lifestyle. Because we get to be where he is. We get to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. So you want that helicopter eye view of what's going on in your life and circumstances. So yours is a life that lives above. It is not designed to live below. And we're learning that lens, that mindset, that, that language that elevates us to the place that Jesus died to give us. 